So I, I'm Kevin Hammond. I come from the uh, University of St Andrews uh, in Scotland. What I'm going to do is to, to uh, tell you uh, a bit about some work that I've been doing with colleagues of mine. Uh, this is Chris Brown and Vladimir Janic uh, as part of a research project that we have running, uh, which is to do with looking at how you, you can exploit uh, refactoring uh, as part of a functionally inspired approach uh, to uh, deal with the problems of, of parallel uh, multi-core programming. So if you want to know more about this, uh, you can follow along with our project uh, or you can follow me. This is my email. This is our project webpage. Lots more stuff for you to, to find out about there. And if you want to, um, please do ask me questions during the talk if you, if you like. The, uh, I'm going to have to keep this fairly quick because I have 15 minutes less than I originally planned for. Uh, but I will happily answer any questions. And please do send me an email or please do get in touch. So it can hardly have escaped your attention uh, that we're in a new um, era of the multi of the multi core. Uh, so in two, roughly 1985, uh, we had the Intel um, 386. This ran at 12 to 400 megahertz. Uh, in 1993, we had a huge leap. We had the Pentium uh, processor running at 600 to 300 megahertz. In 2000, Intel introduced the Pentium 4, running at 1.3 up to 3.6 gigahertz. And then things changed. 2006, we had the first dual-core uh, processor, Intel's um, Core 2 Duo, running at 1.8 to 3.3 gigahertz. And today we've moved up to a period where we have things like this Ivy Bridge uh, hexacore, the six cores, are uh, at 2.5 to 3.6 gigahertz. Something dramatic happened at this point in time. You'll notice, looking at the, uh, looking at the profile, uh, up to this point in time, cores were getting faster. At roughly this point in time, roughly between 2000 and 2005, that stopped happening. Rather, what happened is companies like Intel started to give us um, multi-core processors. They started to uh, develop uh, parallel uh, processing systems as, as mainstream activities. And today, what we have are beasts like this. This is uh, the Intel Xeon Phi. It has um, 40 or 60 cores running in a single package. Okay, so this is the, the current uh, state of the art in, uh, in process technology. Um, the reason why this happened uh, was not just that Intel ran out of ideas. Well, maybe they did. Uh, but the reason this change happened from ever increasing clock speeds to uh, increasingly parallel uh, computers was one of um, having to deal with an energy barrier. In 2000, Intel had uh, a processor running at about 4 gigahertz. Very interesting device. They had it running in the lab. Has anyone got any idea how much power it drew? Over 200 watts. Over 200 watts. Yeah, about 300, apparently. 300 watts. So this thing, it was the fastest processor in the world. It ran at 4 gigahertz uh, on an Intel, uh, Intel Core, Intel CPU. Um, it drew 400 watts. It ran for apparently about a second at a time before it overheated. <laughs> Intel realized that, unfortunately, this was never going to be practical, even on a desktop, and certainly not in a machine like this. So can you imagine carrying around a 400-watt processor sitting in my desktop? Uh, I would get uh, extremely burnt whenever I tried to use it on my, on my lap. And this is why we've moved to these devices. Now, this device is... Very interesting. Uh, have, you, has it, have any of you seen this before? The Intel Xeon Phi? No. So, released last year, 2013. There's a new one coming out this year, which is even better. So, this is great. 40 or 60 cores in a single package. You can plug this into your desktop machine. Uh, it only draws about 120 watts. And you have 60 cores in this device. This is quite a miracle of packaging. There's one downside. Anyone got any idea? Sorry? I.O.? Um, well, that's going to be a big problem. But 
software. Oh, it, run, it runs Linux. <laughs> Sorry? Price. Price. Oh, it's only a thousand dollars. For sixty cores, that's not much. Temperature. It's it's actually actually the clock speed. So the reason you can get a device like this running at uh, using only 120 watts with six, 40 to 60 cores in it uh, is because the clock speed has been cranked down all the way to 1.1 gigahertz. And this is a trend uh, which is happening at the moment. It's a trend which is accelerating. There's a trade-off precisely between how fast you can make cores run between the amount of silicon they occupy and the amount of power that they draw. And roughly speaking, the amount of power, the energy budget that we have available for any processor at, uh, at this point in time is fixed. We can't draw more than two or 300 watts in a desktop machine. Uh, it's not desirable to draw more than probably about 30 or 40 watts in a laptop machine. And it's definitely not desirable to draw anything like that in my mobile phone. So this is the state of the art. So this is what's known as a, the Intel Xeon 5 is an example of a many-core machine. What do I predict? What I predict going into the future, what we'll see is something where we have hundreds of thousands or millions of cores as part of a CPU design. And I am calling this the mega-core computer. Has anyone heard the term before? Good. Has any, does anyone have a, a Wikipedia entry, edit rights? I would like you to please go into Wikipedia now, edit this, and attribute me with the, with the name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make my mark on the world. So what will megacore computers look like? Well, they're probably not just going to be scaled versions of today's multi-core. Uh, they're probably going to have many, many of these very, very lightweight cores. So what we'll probably see are lots and lots of very, very small cores, You're drawing... Uh, running even slower than perhaps the 1.1 gigahertz that we can see in the Xeon Phi. But what they will have is a huge number of different types of cores, GPUs, things to do authentication, uh, possibly ones you can program, soft cores, field programmable, gate arrays, FPGAs, uh, etc., etc. They will be highly heterogeneous. You'll be able to afford to have lots of specialist cores to do particular things. Because the problem is not going to be your, um, it's not going to be uh, fitting a number of gates onto a chip. It's going to be how many of these things you can actually afford to power at a given time. Very frighteningly, for most of today's programmers, they are probably not going to be uniform shared memory. So non-uniform memory access is likely, uh, possibly even hardware distributed shared memory, or even message passing systems on a chip. And Big arrays are not going to be a programming, a good programming abstraction. In fact, shared anything is not going to be a good programming abstraction. We can already see this today. Uh, current architectures, uh, Xeon Phi, already is shared nothing. Uh, even AMD designs, even the latest Intel designs, uh, these are showing aspects of reducing the amount of sharing. So shared memory is supported today it's becoming increasingly hard for computer arch architects to support it in the way that um, C programmers, for example, uh, would like. And this, guys, is where we come in. So fastest computer in the world today. This is as of June 2013. Uh, the, does anyone have any idea where this is? China. China, yeah. It's the Chinese National University of Defense Technology. It has... 3.12 million cores. So the idea that megacore computers are the future is actually not true. They're the present, if you can afford them. Well, I wonder what they're doing with this. <laughs> Defense technology. Hmm. <laughs> and even in Europe, uh, in the project that I'm running with uh, AGH, with Erlang Solutions, uh, we have access... Uh, to a reasonably large-scale system. So we've got access to a machine which has 113,000 Intel cores. This is a supercomputer, of, of course. But it's not just about large systems. E even mobile phones today are multi-core. The Samsung Exynos uh, 5 Octa has eight cores. Very interestingly, you can only run four at a time. Why? Power consumption. Power consumption. 
Yes. So why have eight? Half is faster. Half is faster. So we have four fast chords, which we use when we're playing flappy birds. <laughs> Sorry, when we're doing serious work. <laughs> and we have four low-powered chords, uh, which we use uh, when we're doing things that don't matter, like email and spreadsheets and that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> so you can see where the priorities are. So this idea of having dark silicon, silicon which you can't actually afford to power, is, is becoming increasingly common. But it, it means that we have to be able to deal, as with our heterogeneous system, with systems where the available computing resources are not fixed at the start of the uh, program, which can vary during program execution. We need ways of adapting flexibly uh, to the available uh, hardware resources. We have to deal with the multi-core and many-core challenge. Um, if we don't deal with this, then all the other cool things that people like doing, fun user interfaces, etc., are just not going to matter because we're not going to deal with them. And uh, Intel is particularly concerned by this. But of course they would be. They want to sell you chips. So all future, program, all future programming is going to be parallel. So, but if I have a mega core computer, does that mean that I need to have millions of threads? And isn't that going to be a problem? Well, yes, of course, do. Here is an example profile from one of the uh, applications that I've had running in St. Andrews. Uh, if you look down here, I don't know if you can read this number, it says, 331161522, uh, okay? That is not my phone number. That is the number of threads that are running in this program, okay? 331 million threads, created in about six or seven seconds of execution time. Does anyone run Java? Is your system going to cope with that? Probably not. This is Haskell, by the way. Okay. If you look very closely, what you'll notice is this is actually running on 16-core machine. So you've had 331 million threads created on 16-core machine. The trick is to is this converted figure down here, which is 20,000. What's happened is I've taken my 331 million threads, which is what I would need to run on a very large-scale megacore machine, and I've filtered out from those 331 million the 20,000 that actually matter that allow me to run on a 16-core machine. And that's part of the trick. Having scalable, flexible parallelism that lets you go to really large-scale parallelism, but equally can be scaled down to deal with relatively small-scale machines, 16 cores, 64 cores, 1,000 cores, relatively small scale. I'm going to teach you how to build a wall. Okay? Now, this is basically to situate in your mind uh, some of the issues to do with uh, parallelism. So I was giving a talk in, at the University of Manchester and uh, speaking to Ian Watson, uh, who's a data flow guy. And he said to me, yeah, your talk's very interesting, Kevin, but there are some things that can't be parallelized. Okay, fair enough. Such as, well, building a wall. So how do you build a wall? Well, we've got a bricklayer, Polish bricklayer. Make it local. <laughs> Looks like a Polish bricklayer. So how do you build a wall? Well, you lay a brick, and then you lay another brick, and a third one, and now you've got a row of bricks. And then we lay a brick, and another one. <laughs> it's still standing, yes. <laughs> In Britain, we build like this. <laughs> <laughs> then you lay the next layer of bricks. So you lay another brick, and the second one, and so on. Now you've got the second row of bricks. And now we do the third one. And now we've got a wall. Okay? So clearly this is completely sequential. Or is it? Well, let's imagine that we have four super Polish bricklayers. <laughs> How can we build a wall? 
well, we've got more than one of them, so they could lay a brick. And then they could lay another brick. And now we've got our first level. And then we can do the same. And then we can do the same. And now we've got a wall that is clearly functionally equivalent to the previous wall. You can see that. It's exactly equivalent to the wall that I had before. But we did this in parallel using four uh, amazing bricklayers, amazing Polish bricklayers. So how much faster were these bricklayers using the Polish technique? Three. Why three? Slightly more than three. So roughly three, because although even, even though I have four brick layers, I can only lay three bricks at a time to make the pattern work. So there are things that are fundamental. Even if you had an infinite amount of brick layers with this pattern, you still couldn't run any faster. This is a fundamental limit on the speed up that you could achieve with this particular problem. So about a factor of three, just over a factor of three. Great. Here's how not to build a wall. Brick, 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 <laughs> brick, brick. <coughs> that is a concurrent programming problem. It's ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? Sorry? Dependencies. Dependencies, perfect. So there are implicit dependencies in the brick structure. What I've ended up with is functionally equivalent to the previous wall. You can see that. However, the dependencies mean that it's not going to work in practice. Understanding, recognizing the dependencies is absolutely critical to getting a good parallel execution. So task identification is not the only problem. We also need to consider coordination, communication, placement, which of the brickies does the work, uh, scheduling, which order they, do they place the bricks, and so on. Can, can anyone see a, another way to, can anyone see a way to improve what I've just shown you? Yeah? yeah? You could put four bricks at first, and then two, two other, and two on the left side. I could put four bricks. Here, on the first. Yes. And then two, and other two. So I've introduced, so, so this is actually an example of a very common problem with people dealing, dealing with parallelism, that we see, for example, the fact that I've built a layer at a time, and we think, that's necessary, I have to build a layer at a time. What you're proposing, I think, is having placed two bricks, I can place one on top of them. So in fact, although this uh, layer, level of bricks looks like a strong dependency, if we think sufficiently carefully, uh, for example, if we're Haskell programmers, what we'll realize is that actually what we've got there is a very weak dependency. As soon as we've laid these two bricks, we can lay one on top of it. As soon as we've laid three bricks, we can lay another two, and so on. So actually, you can do quite a lot better than my factor of three, even though I said it was a theoretical limit. Yeah. Typical concurrency approaches, the ones we see in C++, Java, etc., require the pro programmer to solve these problems. We need to get away from that. We need structure. We need abstraction. We don't need another brick in the wall. <laughs> what we need is to think in parallel, uh, using new high-level programming constructs, uh, avoiding issues like deadlocks, etc., uh, without fiddling with communication, etc. This is very contentious, by the way. The slide's very contentious. And also including performance information. For too long, we've got away from the idea that you need to know what your program how your program runs in order to write it effectively. With the new era of parallel programming, we can't afford to ignore issues like performance and particularly energy. It's part of our design. It's going to be part of our design in the future. So how are we going to deal with that? Well, obviously, functional programming. This is Bob Harper from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, you can check, you can verify this quote. It's on his Facebook page. So the nice thing about parallel functional programming, particularly in uh, a language like Haskell, 
is we have no explicit ordering of expressions, uh, which means you can, for example, debug sequentially but run in parallel. There are no locks, deadlocks, or race conditions. This gives us a huge productivity gain. And this just slide to say, and don't think that parallelism is just concurrency. It's much more than that. If I've got 331 million threads, I have to think of them en masse. With typical concurrency approaches, it's like having uh, my children. I can tell each of my children what to do. I can name them individually. I can know exactly what they're doing. If I have 331 million children, on the other hand, the problem is much harder. You can't know what each of them does individually. You have to treat them and program them en masse. And this is what we're trying to do in the project, the paraphrase project uh, that I'm working on uh, with AGH, Erlang Solutions, and other people. So the approach we're taking, start bottom up, think about patterns of parallelism, structure the components into a parallel program, restructure if necessary, and use a refactoring approach to do this. So to situate the work, here are some common patterns of parallelism. So for example, uh, a pipeline hopefully people are familiar with. A map is another kind, so a pipeline, a parallel pipeline, we can have several stages. Each of these stages can run in parallel. With a map, there's a data parallel pattern. We can have a number of workers. Each of the workers can run in parallel over different data items. And there are things too. A reduce is uh, a fold or a fold. Uh, basically collapses things down in a tree structure. And divide and conquer essentially combines things from a reduce and a map. And Google Map Reduce, you might have heard of, combines two of these patterns. Generally, we need to combine or nest several of them. I've been working with my colleagues on something called the Scale Library uh, for Erlang. Uh, this is fully nestable, gives us kind of DSL for parallelism. Uh, please feel free to download it and play, play around with it from here. Essentially, what we're trying to do is we've got something called uh, Run. This is something in the Scale Library. What we do is we provide a skeleton, that is one of the patterns I've shown you so far, an implementation of one of those patterns, give it some input items, and that produces a set of output items. And these things are streaming, so they work over several streams. So here's a parallel pipeline skeleton. Uh, <coughs> there's a picture of it. Essentially what we're doing is providing a tagged structure in Erlang. We've got a pipeline, we've got a number of, of nested skeletons in the same form, we give it some inputs, and what the scale run does is to interpret our parallel structure and execute that in parallel. And you can do this for other things. A task farm basically has a number of workers running in parallel. We collect the results and what happens uh, is again we pass it inputs and we, we run them as before. You need to get the pattern right. So this is just an illustration that if you choose a naive parallel uh, program, so the blue line is what happens if you parallelize Erlang using the obvious approach of creating lots of processes. If you use the scale approach and you choose a farm, what you'll notice is you get much better, not quite straight line, but much better speed up. Um, this is on a 24-core machine running at the University of Pisa. So what we're trying to do, taking sequential code, Erlang, C++, Java, Haskell, we've got a pattern library, we run our sausage factory here, and out comes Erlang, C++, Java, Haskell. Map this down to our heterogeneous architecture. Now, I'm afraid that if you give me Erlang, you don't get Haskell out. <laughs> We're only dealing with the program structure. And this is refactoring. So refactoring changes the structure of the source code using, uh, using well-defined rules, uh, semi-automatically under programmer guidance. So for example, what we can do is to use uh, refactoring to introduce farm. We take uh, a component and we can turn it into farm with a farmer and a number of workers. I've got a very simple example here, uh, image processing. What we're doing is we're reading an image in, two images in. So here we've got a picture of Joe uh, Armstrong. Here we've got a picture of Viking helmet. And what we do is we apply a process called white screening, screening to blank out the background, merge the two images together, write it out. So this is conclusive proof that Joe is actually a Viking. Here's the Erlang structure for that. Uh, what we're doing, we've got uh, a pipeline which basically reads images, converts, merges them, writes them out. 
And the convert image uh, does two things. It white screens and it merges and so on. The parallel, the program structure, so the sequential structure basically says that write, convert, read. <coughs> what we can do in parallel is to have a farm over the reads, pipeline that into the convert operation and farm that. Or we can have other ones too. So refactoring lets us convert between them uh, in a bidirectional way. Now I've got a little demo here but I think I'm going to have to skip it, unfortunately. Five to six minutes. I don't, can you see this anyway? <laughs> Barely. Okay. What I'm going to have to do, I think, is to... So this is, this, is quite, this is quite neat. Good. Well, I've got one question, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, what if problem at hand doesn't quite fit any pattern you yeah, yeah. If it's like a just so so match or you can't find any suitable pattern, can you somehow you know tweak it or you know play with it and somehow kill the missing parts or yeah, it's a very very good question. So the question is if you've got a near pattern, can you uh, can you make it fit? And um, that's an interesting research question. Uh, it's one that we're hoping to look at in the near future. Uh, so the answer is I think so. Yeah. But not in all cases. There'll be things that you can't things that aren't close enough, so you can't always make things match. So this just lets you show what we're trying to do. Basically, we've got a tool here. Uh, this is everyone's favourite refactoring tool, that is Emacs. What we do is we select, for example, a rule from here, which tells us we want to introduce a pipeline. I've done that on the top level. gives us a bit of feedback about what's happening. And then what will happen is once I say, yes, it's okay to do that, down here, it will automatically rewrite my code so that I've now got a pipeline uh, built in here. And we can repeat that for these other stages. So what we do is to, for example, select... So now I've got a three-stage pipeline with the different functions, read, convert, write. If we select one of those, uh, for example, the first one, what we'll see is that we can turn that into a farm and it will do that for us. So let's just show you how the idea works. It's pretty neat. You're getting automatic program rewriting, taking into account performance information that gives us new parallel code structure. Now, you may think that, that was quite uh, simple. We tried to do this to... We tried to tell uh, a group of experienced Erlang programmers about scale and get them to do it by hand. It's amazing how many mistakes you make. The tool prevents all of those mistakes, guarantees the program structure, and moreover, can take into account performance information. This shows you some speed-up results. We're also applying it to large-scale demonstrator applications. These are from an Austrian company that we're working with. Sorry, I'm going very fast now, so I have to cut the talk down. This shows you that the performance results uh, with our approach uh, the solid lines are very close to the ones you get using manual approaches. So they're almost as good as doing things by hand or equally good. So you don't lose anything from doing this. But what you gain is to trans uh, transform development times in days into development times in hours for the parallel component, which we think is kind of neat. So factor 24 uh, performance and productivity improvement. One thing we're doing at the moment is to build an automatic pattern discovery tool. So it's kind of what you were asking. So we think of this as a bit like Googling your program, looking for patterns. So what you get back is a hit list that ranks the patterns in terms of the order of performance. Then you can choose which refactorings to apply. Or you can hit the I'm feeling lucky button and it will pick one for you. <laughs> so to conclude... Like a pattern? Like a Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess so. so social patterns. <laughs> so to conclude, the many core revolution is here, and we have to start worrying about mega core. Heterogeneity and energy are both important. Most programming models are too low level, often based on concurrency. We need to expose mass parallelism. Patterns and functional programming uh, really help with abstraction. They help us introduce the means of threads and help us easily control it. 
Isn't this just wishful thinking? This is Phil Wadler and Hank Burendrecht in St. Andrews. Well, no, we don't think so, because even more conventional languages, uh, C++ 11, Java 8, as used by Silvio Berlusconi, have lambdas and other features that will help us deal with the mass parallelism. And in fact, we have a version of our tool also working in C++, basically reflecting uh, functional ideas of patterns into C++ code. Okay. Lots of things I can show you for further reading. I'm working on a new book at the moment talking about parallel Haskell and this pattern-based approach. Uh, we need to thank our funders. For those of you who are in research in the universities and in companies, there's lots of money out there. This is a good area. Please come and join us. <laughs> and lots of companies are interested in what we're doing, of course. Please come and join us. Thank you. Thank you. So, so the question is whether I've heard of Fortress, and yet, yes, I have, and I've had dinner with Guy Steele. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that familiar. I haven't used any of the parallelism constructs in, in Fortress. Um, I think that they're, they're, what they're doing there, I think, is, is basically at a, a sort of loop parallel level. They're exposing uh, implicit parallel um, uh, code, relatively fine-grained. Uh, what we're doing here... Um, it, and that's done more or less implicitly. The entire conceit of the approach we're taking is one that keeps the programmer in the loop. So um, approaches that are implicitly parallel, they're quite attractive. However, um, up to date, they've only been successful in very, very restricted areas. So if you've got something with essentially nested loops, you can automatically parallelize it. What we're trying to do is go for much, much bigger things. So that's the objective. The I've shown you, I hope, that what we've done here is very generic. So it's not just Erlang, it's not just C++, it's not just Haskell, it's not just Java, it's not just Python, it's all of these things. This refactoring idea, code transformation, you can do on any language. All you need is the tool, the performance information, and the underlying constructs. So we think, yes, we could, do, we could exploit that in Fortress, too. Another question? That's correct, yes. Yes, so again, it goes back to my previous answer, which is, are you trying to keep the programmer in the loop? So the question is about, can you use Scala macros, to example, to hide some of these things? Uh, so the question is, to what extent do you keep the programmer in the loop? And we think that the programmer is still very helpful in terms of defining top-level uh, parallel structures. But certainly techniques like just-in-time compilation, uh, like macros uh, to do uh, particular types of code, um, sorry, particular types of code translation are going to be very important. In fact, one of the things that we're doing in the project is, I didn't get time to talk about it, is to use machine learning technology uh, to basically allow us to automatically adapt at runtime uh, to things like different parallel programming workloads, that, that kind of thing. And interfacing then with macros or just-in-time compilation, indeed, would be very valuable. Uh, but you've been looking at my next project proposal. The machine learning is extremely generic. The tool is very generic. Essentially, all you need to do uh, there, you need information about the program structure, so provided you have the right information about the code structure, and performance information in the right form, then the tools will work on it. So yes, it's, it is very generic. 
doesn't need very much to support it. Thank you very much once more.